Hi, welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global blockchain revolution. My name is Sebastian Cuccio. And my name is Brian Fabian Crane. We're here today with uh, Ben Ballen and Jason Goldberg. So they are the founders of, uh, of Simple Token. Now, of course, I've known Ben for a long time because we used to work together at Monax. And uh, so, so we recently heard about Simple Token. It's a really interesting concept. So I'm excited to have uh, both of you guys on today. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Likewise, appreciate it. So maybe we can start with you, Jason. So you, you have a, a long and interesting history as a startup founder, uh, sort of a, a senior uh, veteran known of many wars. Uh, most importantly, and perhaps best known, you were the founder and CEO of a company called Fab.com, which many uh, listeners, or some of the listeners will probably have some vague memory of, because it was once uh, you know, one of the fastest growing, most hyped, most uh, exciting startups, and then had a somewhat spectacular uh, and, and equally sudden demise. So do you mind sharing us a little bit, like how did you originally get into startups and entrepreneurship and what was your kind of journey through that? Sure, sure. I mean, my, my background with like startups technology actually goes back to uh, the mid '90s, I was working in Clinton White House, um, basically during the the birth of the internet. And there were a couple guys in the White House with me. I was there from '93 to '98, who started looking at things like you know, early browsers and websites, and started you know, saying, "All right, this could really be kind of a, a big thing." And, um, in 1998, I decided that I really wanted to jump into that, and so um, left the White House and went on to Stanford Business School um, in the height of the dot com kind of boom uh, and bubble. Um, and ended up working with a number of startups in the 90s and uh, ended up you know, worked for AOL uh, back when AOL was basically the internet for a while. Um, and so the summer of 1998, um, actually uh, I think yesterday they announced that AIM is shutting down after 20 years. And I remember actually writing a strategy proposal to the executives at AOL uh, back in 1998 about how they should shut down the dial-up service and make AIM the centerpiece of a new communications device that included a media player and group chat and all this kind of stuff. They thought it was crazy. Um, so anyways, um, maybe maybe so maybe the story would have ended up different if we'd gone that direction because um, we had things like WeChat and Skype and stuff like that. Um, but um, but uh, yeah, so after uh, business school, I actually went back to AOL and ran um, is to help start the kind of international broadband initiatives for AOL and then uh, help launch T-Mobile Hotspot was the first kind of product I managed, uh, which is the, was the nationwide Wi-Fi service kind of roll out across the U.S. and Starbucks and Airlines clubs. And um, I worked on the software side of that, so really trying to figure out the user experience and how you onboard people to Wi-Fi. And this is, you know, we take for granted right now that our laptops and our phones all have Wi-Fi you know, built in and you don't have to have a connector. But back then, it wasn't like that. It's almost like, so you can, I guess you can draw some parallels to some things we're thinking on that right now with how do you onboard people to blockchain or to crypto wallets. So that you know, it might seem so commonplace today, kind of Wi-Fi, but back then it was like, you know, it was really really hard. Um, and so yeah, we built like an on ramp to to uh, the, the Wi-Fi hotspots then, and then I rolled out of that and started my own company. First one that I started was in two thousand two, two thousand three, a company called Jobster, um, which is in the social recruiting space, um, and. This was before Facebook, uh, before kind of the social web, and we looked at how do you help, you know, from an enterprise standpoint, help companies hire people through the people that their employees know. Um, and so it was like a who knows who knows who kind of software um, for social networking. Uh, and then uh, from that, uh, in, I met a guy named Nishat Shah uh, during that experience, and Nishat is my longtime collaborator now. Uh, we've been working together since 2007 um, across a number of companies, and he's one of our co-founders of Simple Token today. But so in 2008, uh, January 2008, Nishit and I and about 12 other guys, uh, we started a company called Social Medium, uh, which was a pioneer in kind of decentralized, collaborative news filtering. I mean, it was a notion that um, instead of the news organizations telling you what to read every day, you could figure out what the news that you should that matters most to you based on. But other people that are who share your common attributes are also reading and always interested. 
And that was, you know, again, kind of early before its time, is before the iPhone uh, app store. Um, so um, it was basically just a website. And uh, we grew to 5 million plus users in like five months. It was like a huge like, runaway success back when you could do that. Um, and we sold the company after 11 months to Zing, um, which you guys probably know is like the LinkedIn of Europe. It was, uh, and um, yeah, so I became the chief product officer at Zing, um, public company. Um, had initially from the team came over with me as well. And then in 2010, we started a company called Fabulous, um, which was a gay social network. Um, and then in 2011, we relaunched that as fab.com as a design e-commerce website. And um, yeah, it grew like a weed. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. Um, we did $18 million in sales on our first six months and then 112 in the next 12. Um, and we sold over $300 million in merchandise in the meteoric rise of Fab. And yeah, just as, just as fast as it rose, it fell as well, um, super fast. And, um, you know, we could probably spend several hours and weeks of podcasts about all the mistakes we made on, uh, Fab and lessons learned. But I think, you know, it's, it's very hard to defy the laws of of physics and, um, we grew way too fast is the number one thing. Um, and. Uh, you know, it's also a lesson of, you know, raising lots and globs and globs of venture capital where money doesn't solve everything. you got to get the blocking and tackling right. And Fab was a really, really good business um, for the first, you know, year to 18 months. Um, and then we just expanded too fast and you know, tried to try to rule the world too fast and um, you know, just couldn't keep up with it. And, uh, and then at the same time, also, we ran into something called Amazon, um, which uh, in the early days of Fab, we, we counted it was like less than 10% of the products that we were curating on Fab you could find on Amazon. And by our, you know, by about you know, month 30, at least about month 30 of the business, um, it was like 90% plus. You know, you'd sell something on Fab and the next day you see it on Amazon for you know, lower price free shipping. And it's like, oh, how the fuck do you compete with that? Yeah, so, but um, yeah, obviously you learned a lot of lessons from that. And um, uh, after Fab, we had. Um, a spin out from Fab. So we sold Fab um, to a company called PCH International. We sold the US part of the company uh, in 2014. Uh, and then uh, we had a private label design company, uh, basically brand inside of Fab that was based here in Berlin. Um, and we launched that as hem.com, H E M.com. Um, kind of thing about like the Warby Parker for design um, furniture. And that was a really cool experience in 2015. We built that up and sold that to the Beecher Corporation, uh, which is a Swiss German furniture maker, kind of um, billion dollar plus in revenue. They own all the rights to the Eames products. And hem.com is live today. It's still a beautiful website. The team's doing really well there. Super proud of what they've done. Um, Fab.com is also a live website today. It's, uh, um, it's you know, it's, 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 it has its own ownership now. That has its own directions taken in. Um, and uh, yeah, then early 2016, I started a company called Pepo, uh, P-E-P-O. Um, and the idea behind Pepo is kind of the, the kernel nugget, uh, that concept that took us to uh, Simple Token today. Um, the idea with Pepo was to democratize the market for uh, expertise and advice on user-generated kind of reviews and tips about places and things to do in any city or travel. And the idea from the beginning was rather than the existing models like TripAdvisor and Yelp and Tomato and the like, where everyone just gives away their content for free, um, if we could create kind of a economy around uh, influencers, advisors, um, kind of uh, giving people other tips and getting rewarded for that and then selling other services around it. Um, and it was, you know, so 18 months plus now that we kind of started looking at um, how to build a token economy um, inside of Pepo. Um, and really took it on seriously, I'd say, over the last nine months. And um, the ideas behind Simple Token were all, you know, thankfully, uh, uh, you know, incubated um, inside of Pepo. And, uh, the investors in Pepo are very thankful to as well, who really supported us doing that. From, from the early days of kind of the concepts of how we would tokenize Pepo to six months ago when I said, hey, guys, the answer here is not to tokenize an app, it's to, you know, build the protocol and the software that enables any app to tokenize and everyone said, go work on that, keep going, keep going. Um, that's been really inspiring. And, um, 
yeah, I'll shut up and let you guys ask questions, but I'll say like the, the one thing I'll say is it's the, I've been done a lot in my career and this is far and away the most, the most intellectually stimulating, the most exciting project that to have the most far reaching kind of value and kind of impact in the world. And it's also just really great to be back to building kind of tech again. Uh, you got done e-commerce, which I felt like in the beginning, like we built all of our technology fab. Uh, but I felt like after the first year of building the technology, I felt like it was really just running a store. Um, and I ran that store for three years and then ran another store, Hem, for a year. Um, and Pepo is very much a consumer app thus far. And um, it's really great to be back kind of building technology again. Cool. And uh, I, I got to say, as a, as a young uh e-commerce project manager working in an agency uh, back in like the late 2000s fab I more than once was uh, in my uh, presentations as like having good UX and like you know quite uh, on the cutting edge of uh, you know user experience in e-commerce and so that was uh, that was uh, always one of the, one of the sites that we would uh, reference as uh, you know as site as, as being sort of on, on the cutting edge there I will say that you know of all the lessons obviously tons of lessons learned from the fab experience and I would say that um you know, one of them that I say is, you know, I'm a product manager and I love building product and designing user experiences. And if I had just stuck to that, perhaps, and kind of had someone else run the operations and e-commerce business, maybe it turned out entirely different. So, so thanks for your compliment. Uh, I'm really proud of what we built there. Well, so, so we mentioned, a, a touched a little bit on, on the sort of, you know, raising lots of money fast. Of course, this is something that, uh, I mean, you did back then and that's happening all the time now in, in the blockchain space. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, first, when I look at like the broader kind of story of where we're at on kind of blockchain and kind of decentralized applications is we're kind of in the 1990, equivalent of like the 1993 internet with the 1999-2000 hype. Um, and so it's like, it's still so early, early, early days. I mean, if you think about like the internet in 1993, it was like, you know, pre Netscape browser in 1994, right? It's like, um, it's, you know, before like my friend David Bonnet, who I had dinner with on Thursday night in New York, he started a company called GeoCities, who probably most people listen to this podcast have never heard of, but it was like basically the first way to build your own website, like uh, on the internet. It was like before Tumblr, kind of like a like long, long time ago, right? Um, before Blogger, before, and, and, and GeoCities was like, it doesn't exist anymore. He built, he, you know, he launched it, I think in 1995, 96, and then sold it to Yahoo in 98, 99, and it's like, um, you know, think about we're, how many generations past GeoCities we are at this point in terms of the consumer internet. And I look at the what's happening right now is that the world's gone through this 20-year kind of um, evolution of the internet and seeing things kind of move so fast. In but it's, it was a 20-year period, and in blockchain, everyone kind of wants to run to the answer already when it comes to the investment, uh, but without kind of doing the blocking, tackling to build the infrastructure and the technology. And I think. There's a lot of good projects out there of people who are trying to build that infrastructure and kind of you know, prove out the value of technology. But realistically speaking, I mean, it's early, early, early days. And when, what I kind of repel from is like the, the speculators and the hype that kind of, um, there's way too much money going to the space for the wrong reasons at this point. Um, and, you know, it's because, you know, how did we get here, right? We got here because people see that this could be the, fu the future decentralized internet um, that it could spawn kind of a whole new kind of infrastructure for thousands of different types of, uh, of use cases and applications, and whether it's B two B or B two C, and kind of um, new ways of you know, the entire global payment system could change, the entire global legal system could change, and um, and people see that and they're like, you know, they're the speculators are driving kind of the hype and kind of the, the money behind it, and then frankly, you also just have kind of you know. You have something like you know Bitcoin, which is you know whatever your thoughts are on Bitcoin is you know the value in Bitcoin is still it's very much kind of a, a value kind of like a currency, not a utility. And so the value of Bitcoin is how much the next person is willing to pay for it. Um, and uh, and right now the next person is willing to pay forty three hundred dollars for Bitcoin, um, which is it's come quite a long way, you know, super fast. Um, what I'm more excited is about is, you know, obviously things like Ethereum that have come around, which is like, all right, how do you go from value chain to utility chain? Um, and actually how do you build applications that, and, you know, services that make all this really meaningful and approachable. But everyone's seeing, okay, so Bitcoin went from basically zero to 4,300 and so fast. And then people started that Ethereum could be kind of a development platform for this. And now it's, you know, it's, you know, it's going, you know, to have its own meter price. And, 
Um, everyone in my mind just needs to catch their breath. Oh, that was probably not going to happen. Um, but it's you need to catch your breath and say, all right, you know, let, let's be practical here and kind of realize that it's going to you know, to build applications, to build you know services, to build businesses takes time, and a lot of these projects will fail. And that's I think one thing that a lot of people don't kind of um, uh, kind of uh, factor into their equation is that, you know, just because you give someone $100 million or $200 million does not mean they're going to succeed. In many cases, it means they're less likely to succeed. And, um, yeah, and so, I mean, even take Fab, like, we raised a lot of money, but, you know, we raised money over a long period of time. I mean, the, the first amount of money we raised for Fab, you know, with back when it was fabulous, I put $750,000 in myself, uh, matched by VCs you put in $1.25 million. And, you know, we ran out of that money, like you know, like, and right around the same time that we realized that we had something in our hands that people liked buying design products that we were curating, and we kind of said, "Oh, pivot the business towards this," and then we raised literally it was like five hundred thousand dollars to launch that, like, and that was that was like it was proven on five hundred thousand dollars, and then you know, we proved it, and like within thirty days we raised I think it was like four million dollars. It wasn't like anyone said, "Here's a hundred million dollars, go have fun," right? Um, which is kind of this crazy world that we're in today, but yes, I think you know it's 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 there's been an extreme amount of hype. It's it's um, all sorts of warning signs. I think that you have companies that are considering ICOs for all the wrong reasons. Um, they just see the dollar signs. They just see that they could raise money. Um, you know, I think um, good news on that front is the regulators are coming in, and I'm very pro regulation when it comes to this. I'm pro consumer protection when it comes to this. That I think it's it's um, like for instance in the in the U.S. right now, there's no reputable law firm that will support an ICO uh, for a token that's not a utility token, um, unless you go through all the processes of actually declaring yourself a security, which I don't think anyone in the right mind would want to do in a token sale. Um, and so that kind of has put a real slowdown on kind of bad uh, kind of deals in the U.S. And you see some folks that have then said, okay, we just want to sell to U.S. investors or buyers, and so they. They, you know, well, so if you can't sell to the U.S., you can't sell to China. Who are you selling to? Um, and you know, because you know, that's a large you know percentage of the, the population right there. You just basically just cut out. And it's also, frankly, if you're just selling to security, it's you're going to get you know you're going to get nailed for it. And so, I think you know, there's all sorts of questions that you need to have from a consumer investor standpoint anywhere in the world that's going to come up. And so, whether it's you know U.S., Hong Kong, Singapore, Germany, U.K., doesn't you know, it's like you, it's not going to last too long. And so I think. What we're going to see is a movement towards good projects that are around providing utility, um, that a token is required um, in order to provide that utility. Uh, otherwise, there shouldn't be a token involved. Um, and that we're going to see a lot of people building kind of the necessary on-ramps and infrastructure uh, that are going to enable more applications and services in the future. And um, that's, I think, where we should be at this moment in time. Cool. Well, that was, uh, that was an insightful uh, analysis. <laughs> <laughs> well, so you, Ben, can you share a little bit about your, your own journey? I, I know you worked at MightSafe back then and, and Monax later. What, what are kind of the most important things that you've learned in that time that you, know, you want to take with you when it comes to Simple Token? So, um, yeah, actually, you, you also mentioned that I started out in MightSafe uh, early days, like 2014, I quit university um, and, and I really set out for, for the open blockchain space uh, privacy on decentralized systems uh, and actually there's some lessons that, that we learned there um, that can be carried forward um, and, and maybe we'll get to that uh, but then most of from 2015 onwards I joined you uh, and actually thanks to you right like got in touch with you and then you hooked me into then Eris and uh, now Monax uh, where, where we really worked on um, enterprise blockchain technology right and and the reason that i chose that for myself at that point was to to separate out the incentive uh the mechanism design and and really allow myself to sort of study the technology uh, of blockchain and ethereum and, and and get familiar with that um but while i was doing that and learning that i also i mean i i knew this from the beginning but the frustration there was like Without the incentive design, without the mechanism design, a blockchain doesn't necessarily mean anything, right? So, so we can get into that, but it's a whole different discussion. And so when the ICO hype, if I can call it that, like June happened, I started asking one question. Um, 
namely, is it a zero-sum game, right? Like on the one hand, you have open systems like Ethereum public blockchain. Um, they have the actual values of why we want to build blockchain systems, um, but they're very expensive to run on. It's it's more of a scheduler. It's it's a, it's, it's a simple ledger. Um, but it's not really a decentralized computing system. And, and on the other hand, you have these, uh, these, these enterprises, these technologies that, that are far more powerful, but are um, devoid of, of actual um, meaning if, if you don't have the stake externalized in a system where you can lose it. Um, and so, so I, I, I fundamentally believe that it's not a zero-sum game. And, and the thoughts that, that were arising there is like, um, you can actually combine these two technologies and build something that is far more powerful. If you have the value on public Ethereum, but you do the computations on, on a, just a helping substrate that in itself doesn't carry any value, but, but has all its value externalized on public Ethereum, then you can have best of both worlds. You can have um, the, the crypto economics of Ethereum and you can have enough performance to actually start doing something. And, and so those thoughts started um, maturing over, uh, uh, over the summer. And then um, I've been friends with Jason for a long time. And so I knew he was working on Simple Token as well. And so, so that really kicked it, uh, kicked it off there uh, for us. Or for me to jump on board full time with Simple Token, rather, because they've been working on this for a long time, uh, and so so on a point to that, right? Like um, what I found really attractive to Simple Token the project was that they really worked from a business case first, from from like economic ideas and from legal ideas of how would you use this technology to solve real world problems for actual existing consumer applications at scale. Um, and so to then design the technology for that was, was really too exciting to, to not join in on. So moving to the topic of uh, Simple Token, uh, in uh, the documentation on the website and the white paper, you uh, explain that uh, Simple Token will be first deployed uh, in its first uh, use case on a, a service or a website called Pepo. Can you tell us about Pepo and then you know, perhaps uh, move into Simple Token and how it will be useful in that context. Sure. So, I mean, so what I think about Pepo is we wanted to build a democratized, uh, user-generated tips and review service where people who are influencers, people who kind of contribute their their tips, their content, uh, could earn money by uh, helping other people with their advice. Um, and that's whether it's where you know place to travel, place to dinner tonight, um, you know, walking tours of your favorite city, whatever it might be. Uh, and the notion was that uh, you know we would want to build an economic model around this, where you know you have kind of like you know, the Instagramization of the world, where everyone thinks they're an influencer, uh, but yet you still have people giving away their content for free to these large decentralized applications. Um, and you have you know very large companies like TripAdvisor and Yelp. And Others like them who have basically built their businesses and advertising models on the backs of all this free contributed content from, from users. Um, and so we had this theory that if we created this kind of um, platform for people to first to interact and contribute their tips and reviews, uh, and then a way for them to um, actually you know, kind of monetize people finding those tips and reviews relevant, um, that then around that you can build an economy around uh, people selling related services, whether it's someone, you know, creating a personalized itinerary for you or a, um, you know, a tour guide or whatever it might be. And ultimately it came down to kind of a, you know, becomes an economy when the, the end consumer, the end user may, has a choice when they want to purchase something that they either, they understand they either could take out their wallet and buy it or they could take out their time or content or data and earn it. Um, and then you have people kind of, kind of start before like, Bitcoin being just basically a sort of course of form of payment, you go towards more like something where actually people are earning a living or earning uh, through a currency, and then you start to develop an economy. Um, and so we started developing these ideas behind kind of you know the monetization um, and economy of Pepo like over a year ago. It was basically June, July of last year. Uh, we kind of developed some kind of like the economic theory behind it. Um, we built out kind of models around uh, things like 
you know, how do you monetize upvotes? Um, how would you maybe give people um, some kind of incentive, uh, kind of currency or token, or whatever time we're calling a token, we're calling it kind of PIVO points or whatever it might be, that, that had some economic value to it, um, that they could then um, you know, contribute when they're liking other people's content, um, and that people are earning you know, based on seeing that the more they contribute, the more people like their content, the more they can earn, and then from that they then could um, you know, use the, the, uh, the points or the tokens that they're earning towards um, buying products that are related to the marketplace. And so you can see every time that you have an economic choice, do I want to you know, spend my night writing 50 reviews and hopefully people like them, or do I just want to jump the line and buy some points and buy the service? Right? Um, and so we fleshed out kind of an economy behind this. And you know, to be you know to be fair, you know, folks like uh, you know Reddit influenced some of this with some of the things that they've done, um, but obviously not attached to a cryptocurrency. Uh, Steam it. Um, you know, when Steam first came around, we looked at this and we said, okay, really cool idea here, but gosh, there's a lot we could do to improve on kind of the user experience and the transparency, and, um, and so we really saw some opportunities there. Um, I had like it must be a dozen people, especially the VCs I know really well, when Steam launched and said, you know, look at this and make it ten times better if you can. And I was like, all right, we're, we'll, we'll get there and try. It. So um, and and then basically what happened is we kind of said, all right, let's just focus on the core technology of Pepo for the rest of 2016, and we'll turn back to the token economy in 2017. And our plan was basically mid 2017 to really take on kind of the tokenization of Pepo and kind of in earnest. And um, a couple of things collided at the same time in early 2017. So um, one is um, my longtime collaborator, co-collaborator Nishif, who had taken 2016 off, he um, came back from his year sabbatical and said, hey, I've just been studying blockchain. And um, I know you're talking about kind of how to create an economy around Pepo, and I've been studying this year for the last year, and you know, we really should consider whether we would bring you know, parts of the Pepo app on a blockchain and Think about kind of the token economy, and I said, "Oh, I had been thinking about this also, you know, in terms of you know, looking at things like you know, Steam and other things." And we brought it out the economy, and then we also modeled out kind of user experience and what that might look like, and um, started talking to kind of some of the key actors and influencers in the marketplace, and kind of seeing how they would want to earn and what kind of things regular consumers would want to kind of you know, spend on and that sort of stuff. And then obviously you had the ICO kind of kind of craziness that happened, you know, starting since I guess like. March or April of this year, um, and a lot of people started, you know, just saying, "All right, you, know, you guys are there in terms of, you know, having kind of designed a token economics. You've um, designed uh, you know, user experience. Um, you know, why don't you go ahead and kind of go for it and try to think through how you would, you know, kind of launch a we call it a people coin token." And there were a couple of aha moments that kind of led to simple token, um, and. I'd say so like one really cool project on Pepo has led to something that's much, much, much bigger and much greater and that um, can have a much bigger impact. And, um, and to the, so the two aha moments were, um, one, basically back in starting in May, uh, we really started like digging into what would be involved in um, just tokenizing Pepo. Um, and just when, and we looked at, um, if you put aside even like the cost of doing an ICO, which runs over a million dollars, I don't think people realize this today, but just all the all the work you got to put into it from the legal, regulatory, tax preparation. Um, I mean, it's super like it's not easy um, and it's not cheap. Um, if you want to do it right, and I guess if you want to do it as a shady project, go for it and see what happens. But um, and but then you just put that aside and you just look at we looked at all the technology that we would need to build in order to basically tokenize one app, um, and you know we looked at all right. Things that we would need to overcome. We would need to overcome, you know, public Ethereum isn't yet scalable to consumer applications. We would need to come up with some sonic solution, whether it's private chain, off chain, permission chain, side chain, whatever it is. And um, and that's kind of, you know, I've known Ben for a long time here in Berlin, and we can start talking about some of these concepts and how to achieve that. Um, and but you know, even just and you know, most consumer app developers are not going to figure out that part on their own. Um, but then we looked at, all right, so what would we need? In terms of inside of you know Pepo, well, we had this notion of having kind of um, warm up or restricted tokens, where basically you would give tokens to um, users to kind of warm them up um, to kind of get them used to the kind of um, spending on certain activity. So they would almost be like a locked token that you could um, you couldn't just the user can't just cash it out themselves, um, but once they transfer it to another party, you could even say once it's transferred between 
you know, for, to two or three parties that maybe someone could actually cash it out. Um, so we had to kind of you know, do some innovations on that front. Uh, we looked at how you know, innovations we would need to do in terms of, you know, we would need to build KYC um, into our app. We would need to build, so for when people are cashing out, you're you know, required to know who your customer is when they're kind of turning their points or tokens into real money. Um, you would, or to fiat, because it's all real money now, um, you would need to, uh, you know, innovations around user-friendly wallets, around setting up various transaction types, and maybe sometimes the transactions are, you know, peer-to-peer, -peer, uh, completely, you know, decentralized with no uh, intermediary and no transaction fee, but maybe other types of transactions are going through kind of the, the community manager, in that case, Pepo, who is taking a transaction fee on certain types of transactions, Maybe you enable users to sell services directly to each other. You would need to kind of enable kind of how do you set this up? Almost like setting up SKUs on like Shopify or something like that. And we kept unraveling. Well, we have to do this. We have to do this and do this. And then you know we also have a lot of experience. Our team on building like internal tools, like admin dashboards. And I think what a lot of people don't realize is like if you're going to tokenize an app, you need to like manage an economy, right? So you need to understand all the sources and uses. Um, uh, understand like. Are people hoarding tokens? Where are they earning? Um, be able to monitor every single user and kind of look at trends in the, the token economy. Um, and um, and I know this like might sound like a lot of like oversight from like the decentralized world, but from an app developer, um, this is something that's critical for like managing your economy, um, not just letting it be a free for all and kind of say all right, whatever happens happens. Um, and so we looked at all this stuff that we would have to build, and it was just like this, you know. Duh, like, you know, if we're going to build all this for one app, that'd be crazy. We should build this for, you know, for everyone. Um, and I think what it spoke to was that there is a lot of amazing, you know, kind of infrastructure plumbing projects that have been going on in the blockchain world. Um, and, you know, even, you know, us at Simple Token, we will leverage many of them. But for a consumer app developer or any app developer from that standpoint, who does not have their own blockchain developers, um, you know, they would need to first have their developers learn blockchain technology, and then cobble together this and this and this and this and bring this together and kind of, you know, that would take years for them to kind of build, to be able to kind of create their own token economy in a meaningful way for one app. And we realized that this, this was, was needed as kind of this middleware layer um, that would enable kind of, a, kind of a, an on-ramp for app developers to be able to embrace, um, you know, blockchain technology. It's almost the equivalent of, let's say, you know, Uber and Airbnb um, they didn't have to build their own messaging services, but they didn't because it's not their core business. So instead, they use Twilio. Um, or, you know, if you're launching an e-commerce site today, you, you know, very few build it from scratch the way we do with Fab. Most of them will just start with Shopify or big commerce and like that. Um, and you know, we look at it as like one of the things that's kind of missing and kind of opportunity or white space um, in the tokenization of blockchain world was to create kind of a very robust, very useful middleware layer that. Um, app developers could use as their on-ramp to both create and manage their token economy. Um, and, and I think then the other aha, which, you know, again, might not be the same religion as everyone um, in the blockchain world we had was um, our approach with, with Pepo is the same approach that, you know, that I've had with or I've heard back from lots of other consumer app developers is, you know, basically, you know, it, it, we don't buy into this notion that everything has to be a centralized app. Not everything is going to be a DAP or a DAO um, or DAP and DAO. And it, like, it's like it is possible that thousands, tens of thousands, millions of companies can benefit from having parts of their business on a blockchain without having the entire business on a blockchain. Um, and that opens up a whole new set of opportunities um, that you know we think can be critical to taking you know blockchain technologies from. What is today a very, 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 very small end consumer adoption to more of a mass market adoption? Um, that if we, if it's just going to be all about decentralized applications, um, it's I think it's it's a little naive and I think utopian to think that the entire world is going to become decentralized. I think there will be both decentralized apps, there will be both centralized apps, there will be hybrids in between, uh, and we see a great opportunity to be kind of a bridge between them. Cool. Jason, can you walk us through an example? So let's say now Pepo says, okay, we're gonna we're gonna use Simple Token to create our own token economy and to create a Pepo coin. Like, what what would the steps be that they would go through? Yeah. So the simple way to think about uh, Simple Token is the the project consists of three parts. Um, so the first is ERC twenty token, 
um, which uh, is basically part of a protocol, um, which is the OpenST protocol. Uh, so ST stands for civil token. And the protocol, uh, which Ben can espouse more on, is basically the process by which uh, a company or an organization or an individual would take civil token and stake it uh, against creating uh, their own branded tokens on uh, supply chains uh, in a cryptographically audible manner um, so that uh, essentially you power your branded economy uh, with simple token behind it. And we'll go into that in more detail. So part one is the simple token itself. Uh, part two is the protocol. And then part three is the software package uh, that we're building, which is basically think about like the SaaS software that is, enables you to create and manage your token economy. Um, and so the process that a company would go through, um, I mean, the first thing we look at is, even before talking about like, like the functional process, like the, like we look at is one benefit of the ICO hype is that a lot of companies for the wrong reason started thinking about tokenization because they just saw dollar signs. Um, we think, you know, if they don't have a valid token economy or a reason to have a token economy, they should just kind of, those guys should just fall away. But then you have this like next set who actually, a lot of really interesting companies have done a lot of work over the last months to try to figure out how they could use tokenization um, to create economic incentives, rewards, to uh, monetize uh, microtransactions, to monetize people giving up their content, their data, their privacy in all sorts of interesting ways to help take, say, what today is a, you know, what should be a two-sided marketplace but is only one-sided and trying to kind of fuel the other side with tokenization. Um, and so and we can go through all sorts of examples. For those guys, a lot of them then hit this kind of like this wall where they kind of say, oh, yeah, we would have to then to build all this stuff. And so we want them to say, okay, we'll build on civil token because we'll give you um, everything you need in order to kind of get from here to there, to launch your token economy. Um, and so essentially what they go through is um, they basically, the starting point is you, you stake simple token against creating your own branded token. And using our dashboard kind of tools, you would basically set a, an, exchange, an exchange rate, a fixed exchange rate between um, simple token and your branded token. So let's say you wanted to start with 1,000 euro of branded of simple token, and you want to create uh, 101 exchange rates, so you create you know, 100,000 of your branded token. So let's say we call it you know, Brian coin. Um, and you then basically have 100,000 Brian coin uh, that are basically you know, at your disposal uh, that have been created on the sidechain. Um, and you can you know, then kind of set up various transaction types uh, within our dashboard. Um, you can say, we want to enable you to spend those tokens on, say, a peer-to-peer -peer transaction where Brian's community doesn't take any transaction fee. It's entirely between the users. Maybe it's one user saying, if you pay me, you know, they can set their own prices for it. Here's what you, know, my, you can buy my service. Um, it could be a incentive transaction that you set up that incentivizes users to do, take certain actions inside the application. It could be rewards that they unlock by taking certain certain ac actions, uh, much like we've seen in games and other things over the years. Um, it could be a B two B transaction. It could be for an API call. It could be so basically you set up various transaction types, um, uh, and then basically all the transactions that happen. Um, within Brian's community are all on that side chain. Um, and so they're all, um, you know, kind of, they're all kind of uh, recorded on the chain, um, but they're not on public Ethereum. And it's only when, say, a user of Brian's community wants to either cash out, um, so basically wants to take Brian coin and get 10 euro for what they've earned, um, or when uh, that user wants to buy more Brian coin, um, that you need to basically go back out to the Ethereum mainnet um, and either acquire and stake more simple token or drop a stake token in order to support a cash out scenario. Um, and what this enables is basically the companies involved to have somewhat of a safe environment to have kind of the you know, have their transactions uh, on a blockchain to have it then tied to the actual cryptocurrency without having the legal regulatory risk involved with doing their own ICO and token sale, without having to build their own technology to do it, and also creating a safe environment for their users. Um, we can get into stuff like we're working on in terms of possible ways to do price stabilization. Um, we provide price oracles so let's say users can price in their local fiat and have it automatically converted to the then price 
of uh, you know, equivalent price and civil token, the branded token. Um, and so enabling kind of the safe environment for these token economies to, uh, to, to start to take off and flourish. And so what we provide then for them you know, is a kind of this suite of tools or technology then to manage all this as well. So how do you analyze your economy, um, see you know, kind of where are things, um, you might see certain places where people are, you know, certain users are hoarding tokens, certain people users are, um, these kind of transactions seem to be working really well. Um, you might see certain gaps in your economy where um, you have a lot less uh, demand than you have supply in certain areas. And how do you, as a community owner, how do you act on that? And so there's a lot of things just in managing and also managing kind of potential fraud risk and you know, that sort of stuff. I can see the value in in, in the in sort of the use case here, right? So I, I, I think the, the, the main thing that uh, we can take away here is that we've got this We've got this platform on which we can build tokens uh, without without all these risks, right? Whether it's legal risk or or the risk and uh, associated to having an ICO or even having to do an ICO, uh, because that that's a that's sort of a, a thing in itself. Um, and and also as a as a user, you know, you, you don't have to to um, come into this with any sort of prerequisite knowledge of cryptocurrencies or even as a company, right? You're just sort of onboarding this platform that provides you all, all the tools and all the um, all the things that you need to, 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 to build your your token economy platform. What I'm curious here, and, and maybe Ben, you can address this, is uh, uh, how, how these side chains are managed. So the, these, these, uh, um, these I, I guess, sort of ecosystems within uh, within Simple Token, how are those side chains managed, and who validates it? Who validates those chains? What what's the trust model there? Because uh, I I have some, some sort of questions about how how you know, what what the model is there. So we 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 briefly already top, uh, touched on some of these points, right? So um, what the trust model really starts from is that it is, is from the protocol itself. So the protocol. Um, is built to make sure that the value is protected on Ethereum and then once um, once it's locked there and it's protected by proof of work uh, validation then then you can uh, get more mobility of the coins. So, so, so one way that, that I like to think about it, um, if you would go back a hundred years we would have gold in the vault of the banks and we would have issued this more portable IOUs, these, these cash notes. The problem there is that you cannot be sure that the gold is still in the bank. Um, what cryptocurrencies and, and blockchains allow us to do is to issue uh, these, these sort of cash notes um, that are far more usable and, and have higher utility. Um, but for each note individually, you can verify that the gold is sitting in the bank. And so that's really the mental model sort of that, that, we, that we build OpenST for, um, namely that it's two sides of the same token. On top of that, um, there's, there's a lot of technology for proof of stake um, validation, right? So it's more efficient, but the question is, what are you staking? And so here we can actually very easily solve that problem because the value that validators are staking on these utility chains that, that, that's, that function as sort of workers, as, as replaceable workers for public Ethereum, the value that those validators are staking is held on, on Ethereum. And so, so you actually get sort of the best of both worlds where, where you have a cryptographic protocol that ensures that, that all your value is always recoverable and protected by public Ethereum, but you get to interact with it more easily, uh, cheaper costs and, and faster uh, by, by extending uh, it onto this open periphery of, of utility chains. Who those validators then are, um, the mental mo or the model that we're pursuing right now is that for any given utility chain, it would be uh, an assortium of member companies, uh, potentially auditors, but there would be sort of a, a large pool of, of uh, verified players that are both capable of running a reliable service um, and, and have uh, non, non uh, overlapping interests. To, to be these validators and they have to actually stake value to be validating on those chains and if, if something goes wrong with that process they'd lose the value and the users of the utility chains could uh, walk back to Ethereum and, and prove their holdings and, and uh, recover those uh, without uh, losing any money.
Um, so that's really the sort of the decentralization model of this is, is an open network of utility chains that that can expand um, the, that we don't also control. Obviously, uh, people can add to that, uh, but, but obviously we'll try to help the first 10 and 10,000 member companies to, to get that set up. Key thing is it shouldn't be us, right? So like you know, we, we provide the protocol, we maintain an enhanced protocol, we provide the software. But we do not manage the side chains. Like that needs to be done in a centralized manner. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that's one of the points where, where this is interesting, right? Because I think we, we see on a high level, like right, what you guys are explaining, I think, you know, it's, it's obvious it's, things are going this direction. It's obvious a lot of companies want to start doing, you know, integrating tokens. And it's, it's quite obvious and correct, I think, as you guys point out, is that, you know, they're not equipped to do that. There's all kinds of problems that have to be solved. But where I think this gets interesting and sort of hard to wrap your head around is, is you know, where, where's the sort of border between uh, a centralized application, a decentralized application, like where does a blockchain still make sense and where not? And I, I think one, one point where that's interesting is, is where you guys write about that on, on those side chains, actually those are kind of like managed accounts and, and the users generally don't control their own funds, their own seeds. And, and for example, that you're not really able to have like a secondary market on these tokens, right? You're not able to just sell it to somewhere else. And, and so there's still like uh, almost, you know, very much control of the company. So why, why is a blockchain really needed here? So I think that if you think from a, from a, a business perspective, um, a couple of things. So one is um, we first looked at, you know, consumer apps. Um, we want to we want to walk them towards and consumer apps and consumer users. We kind of want to walk them towards a lot of the challenges that might happen from having a, a token economy, um, while enabling some of the benefits, right? And so um, enabling you know some of the benefits in terms of you know having uh, the openness, the transparency, the immutability of transactions, um, enabling benefits in terms of interoperability across uh, other kind of member companies that are also using uh, the tokens, we'll talk about that a little bit. But at the same time, like you give an example, like from a business perspective, like if a consumer app um, had a token that was you know, freely floating um, and tradable, um, you know, that, that could cause all sorts of problems of unintended consequences um, that needs to be factored into the beginning. And I think a lot of folks don't necessarily appreciate right away. Um, they just think, you know, we're gonna do an ICO and have a token. But, you know, if you're in a, running a consumer app and you, let's say your user earns $10 with the tokens today and then tomorrow it goes to be worth 20 or 25. Um, you have all sorts of hoarding effects and you know, massive you know, cash outs from users who suddenly are rich. Um, and, uh, you know, and then if you have the other direction, let's say it goes from $10 to $2, um, you know, people lose entire faith in the economy and they just give up and they, just, they don't participate anymore. Um, and so, so that's just you know, one notion in terms of we wanted to create an environment where um, there could be some protection around uh, some of these things like price fluctuation that the company could help mitigate um, uh, within this and, you know, as part of a service to provide to their users so that they build the economy bit by bit. We also found that um, you know, our you know, user research uh, has basically found that today's crypto wallets are a big impediment to consumer adoption. Um, that if a consumer is, uh, you know, just using one application, um, that they don't, it's very hard to explain to them crypto keys and seeds and kind of private keys and all that sort of stuff that, you know, that we understand, but, um, that, you know, it's going to, we need to educate users and walk them there bit by bit by bit. So we looked at how do we kind of create a path for people to, um, you know, so for instance, you know, how do you get, have the user understand that it is based on a cryptocurrency because they're seeing some fluctuations in its value, but not wild swings. And then they start to realize that, okay, if I want to spend this token that I earned in this one community on this other community, I see that they're both powered by simple token. And I, if I claim my crypto keys, then maybe I could, or have some way of kind of taking over permission for my crypto keys, then I could um, do that and kind of cut across these networks. Um, and to walk people down the path uh, towards educating consumers around crypto and crypto wallets. Um, and then also just from, also from a company standpoint, I gotta say that it's kind of madness and I think just kind of, kind of silly in my mind to, to even um, think that the world's going to, the market's gonna support tens of thousands of different freely floated uh, consumer tokens. 
um, that uh, there'll, there'll be no market for them. So uh, they, you know, they would launch all these ICOs or all these tokens, or even if they, let's say they had their token through us, but then it was, if there was a secondary market for it, um, there'd be like no demand for it, you know? And so it's like, it'd be like, like the, the far, far, far OTC kind of stock market where no one's buying. And, you know, that's gonna, you know, have massive negative impact on your, your economy as well. And so we said, you know, don't have these tokens be, have a secondary market for them. Don't have them floating to start. Create a safer environment to build trust with users and walk them down the path of understanding um, crypto and seeing the benefits of being on a blockchain. And then we've also imagined, though, we've imagined, though, that um, we can see ourselves not just as an on-ramp um, for these companies um, and to their users, but also that you know, if a, if a company within Simple Tokens kind of ecosystem proves out liquidity, they prove that they actually have an economic model and there's demand for their tokens, and you know, people are buying them, people are trading them, people are earning them. We can also enable, uh, you know, basically the lock that we put in that enables there to be no secondary market. We basically could like, you know, unlock that and enable them to float their own token, but do so once, they, once they've already proven that there's actually a reason uh, for that token to float and there'd be demand for it in the marketplace. So it's almost like think about simple token and that model being kind of a, a on-ramp or an accelerator or incubator for, uh, for tokenization projects. So there's a couple of things here that, that are very good in your question, right? So, so obviously all of us um, are very much the, of the philosophy, your coin, uh, your key, your coin. Um, at the same time, we, as we're actually, we're bridging to consumer applications. And so we, we need to have a better user experience for people who do not know what their private key is and how to properly protect it, right? Um, and, and so recently, Vlad, um, Vlad Zamfir coined uh, heart spooning, uh, forcefully giving coins to, to users. And so, so this is what we're effectively trying to do, right? Like, you know, that, that, that was the Cosmos team that coined that. Uh, okay, a small comment. <laughs> Jay on his latest keynote actually quoted Vlad for that. So, so that's why oh. I attributed it to Vlad. Um, anyway, Cosmos, Vlad, um, the concept of heart spooning has, has arisen where how do we forcefully give users crypto keys but then we have a responsibility right we need to give them a good ux um, to 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 deal with these crypto tokens why do we care about decentralization it's for increased resilience right um, and so in the white paper we talk about um managed keys uh and and it's a, it's good to to stand for a moment and, and elaborate what we actually mean with that um, because we definitely do not want member companies to be holding the private keys of the users. Um, that would be just a giant liability for any of the member companies. Um, they wouldn't have the expertise, just as most users don't have expertise of how to manage uh, uh, private keys, nor do most member companies have the expertise to manage them. Uh, and so there are some smart tricks that you can do because you have these two parties where only in the client side of the application you deterministically recover uh, a private key. And then you need to be smart on how you can uh, have users reset their password, etc. Um, and so I think we've solved that. Uh, we'll be writing a lot more on that. Uh, maybe by the time actually this is out, uh, then uh, we, we bridge, right? That's the whole point. We want to make sure that um, there is a continuous spectrum from, from users who do not yet know what crypto tokens are, uh, allowing them to start using it without understanding it and then discovering uh, what they are. So starting to write down their seed phrase, um, starting to uh, uh, get a standalone wallet, really having their own private keys uh, all the way out to public Ethereum. So, so that we can start having the adoption of hundreds of millions of users onto blockchain systems. Um, I think that, that the only way that we can really start moving the space forward here is by, by having this continuous spectrum of solutions uh, for all users to, to learn along their own path. Ben, we, uh, we actually met the, this weekend, uh, mm -hmm. this past weekend in, in Berlin um, for the, the 9984 summit. I uh, just want to Give a shout out to the Big Chain DB team for that event. It was really, really fantastic. And uh, 
when uh, when we met, the, we were talking about GDPR. Uh, of course, uh, this is the uh, general data protection uh, regulation in Europe that comes into effect in uh, May of this year. Uh, and so GDPR, for those who are not familiar, is a set of regulations that will impose uh, well, certain constraints on uh, European businesses or businesses doing business in uh, Europe on topics of sort of uh, data portability, personal data, right to be forgotten, um, you know, consent to you, uh, companies using your data in certain ways. So companies will have to come out um, and, and be quite open and, and transparent about how they use customer data uh, before a customer engages in some, any, any sort of relationship with that company. Um, and so, there, you know, companies in Europe are, are, are struggling to figure out how they're going to be compliant with this just in sort of the regular centralized company model, right? Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, and because I, I know we, we talked about this, so what are your thoughts about how uh, you know GDPR will affect your business and your customers' businesses? And have you found ways to uh, you know make Simple Token uh, uh, if, if, uh, effectively a GDPR compatible? Compliant. Yeah, so so um, you're right to point out that for most companies, this is already a hard problem to solve. Like, how do you get better, more informed user consent about their data uh, being processed? Um, and then, if you take that to blockchain-inspired audiences, they'll 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 almost all unanimously come to the conclusion that these laws are written um, in a way incompatible with with where this technology is going, because the whole point of uh, a blockchain is for there to be an immutable record that that forever stays. So, so the most cl glaring example is the right to be forgotten. Um, how would that ever be be affected on a blockchain, right? Um, and so, so here we actually have um, an, an interesting solution to look at because we 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 don't like Jason said, right? Like not all of your business needs to be on a blockchain for most businesses. Um, and what does need to be on a blockchain for a token to have value is namely the balances, right? Like how much money does a given user have? And then that user is represented by pseudo anonymous addresses. Um, and so that is a first concern that, that we, or, or criteria that we put forward is like, we'll only store balances and uh, um, uh, pseudo anonymous addresses on the chain. Um, and, and we have an additional nice feature, namely we're doing this form of functional sharding, right? Like public Ethereum holds the grouped value for the token economy. So the total worth of that value is staked and locked on public Ethereum. Um, and so as the individual transactions do not need to get registered on public Ethereum because from Ethereum we cannot erase anything. But a utility chain that sort of just functions as a as a substrate to to help this economy register and settle its its uh, its its transactions in a cryptographic way can have a finite lifetime, even if it's after a year and a half or two years that sort of the use the the, the chains get recycled. Um, they they don't need to uh, live on forever, whereas public Ethereum. Uh, for as long as it may live uh, and may live long and prosper um, uh, will uh, carry on forever, right? So, so, so even then, um, you, you, you start having these very interesting possibilities. Also, the implementation of payment channels is much more simple if you have structure of a company handling the receipt. So you have the data availability, data availability problem uh, much reduced. Um, and on top of that, uh, we can be even smart on trying to cut uh, correlations between pseudo-anonymous addresses when they're being settled on, on the chain. So, so I'm pretty confident that we can actually connect useful user experiences um, with blockchain technology, externalizing the value of the tokens that you hold without uh, exposing and so forcefully cutting at multiple points uh, your your possibly personally identifiable information uh, and forever keeping it off these systems. Um, and that will be, will be very important if you try to resolve uh, the use of blockchain technology with, um, with, with data protection regulations. And, and, and again, the same way that we want to build a bridge and onboard these users, we have a big responsibility, right? Like we're addressing, trying to get all these uh, millions of users onto blockchain systems. We can't just forcefully have them, uh, or it's not going to work if we require them to 
sign away their privacy um, neither by the GPR law or they wouldn't sign up for that. So, so we have a responsibility to, to make sure that, that it doesn't happen, that their personal, personally identifiable information never gets onto the blockchain. Yeah, that does make sense. I mean, of course, there, there is a little bit, I don't know, for me, this sort of feeling like, okay, yeah, so you're solving this problem in some way, but it's also, you know, it, it's really, go, it's moving so far away from a blockchain that it, it's, it's hard to grasp. I mean, I don't know if over time, maybe simple token... Can I challenge you? Because what do you mean sure. when you say it's moving so far away? All the value you're interacting with is actually only on Ethereum, right? Um, that's the whole point of the protocol. So it sits on the second largest public blockchain. How, how is it moving far away? I, I, I really want to just challenge that, that sort of question. Okay, great. Um, yeah, of course. So, so there is the part on the Ethereum blockchain, but it's just the trust model of that, of that private blockchain is, is, is seems to be, it seems to be so closely vetted to the company almost that but there's no, 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 that's the whole point, right? Like we wouldn't be building a bridge if it wouldn't be cryptographically audible all the way back to Ethereum. And if any user couldn't at any point without permission of either the company or anyone else, hard exit back to Ethereum, walk away with its value or if any of those utility change could on halting not exit fully onto Ethereum, we wouldn't be doing this. If, if this wouldn't be cryptographically verified the whole way, yeah, you would have a point, but I don't think you have a point. It's all value is only on Ethereum. We're just making it efficient. So, so, so throwing these words of like moving away from blockchain technology to me don't really mean something because you can either say like this is the limits of the technology we have or you can try to use the technology and the core principles that we also hold and share and and try to make them more usable for more people um and so yeah that would be my my challenge yeah i mean as so we didn't speak about this so much right but you guys have this concept of a standalone wallet right but basically where the co the person kind of runs their own i guess it's kind of comparable to a cryptocurrency wallet and now I see how there you have some some assurance, right? Because you guess locally have these proofs and you can then take them. But if you have the, the kind of normal, quote unquote, normal user case where somebody just uses the company's application, then well, I, I actually you can't really do anything, right? Because you the, those proofs that you may be able to take to like unlock the coins on the Ethereum main chain, like you don't have access to them, right? Because you could only get them through the application that the company itself is running. Do, do you do, am I missing something here? The, the, the proofs to exit, you can re yourself extract from, from the chains and the chains are open and you can verify them yourself. So, so you could do that if, if the company doesn't operate uh, or, or cooperate. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that, that is a fair point, I guess, to the extent that, yeah, the blockchain is audible. And, and I guess if, if you can identify the transactions that belong to you, uh, how do you do that? Is there some kind of seed that you, but then you'd still need, as a user, need some kind of seed to back up, you no, know, to see. Okay, yeah, yeah. The blockchain. So, 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 I mean, you, but, but here's the point, right? Like, even if you start out with the, what we call the managed keys, the company cannot move your tokens without you being logged in and actually on your client side interacting with the application, right? So, so even then, like, there's, there's you um, on your client side signing the transactions. Um, it's true that as a user, you're not aware that you have a private key. And so storing that private key just randomly in the browser would be a bigger security risk than, than uh, uh, having it only deterministically generated when you're logged in. So, so we, we, unless the user realizes it and, and makes the action of getting a standalone wallet, there's nowhere for that private key to go on the user side, right? So, so there's, there's a lot of things we can do, but there's no magic involved. Um, and until that user realizes that, that he needs to get a standalone wallet to further up his, his ownership of those private keys, um, he, we can't do anything um, by storing them on, on, uh, in cookies or something. I think that would be worse. Yeah, thanks so much, Ben. So let's, let's move to some, maybe just a few high level questions again. So, so Jason, where do you see this company in 10 years? Like, what do you want this to look like? 
Yeah. So you know, we look at it as that there's there's as you know, there's Ben said two sides of the coin, but we look at from a project standpoint, there's two distinct parts of the project. On the one hand, there's the OpenST Foundation, um, which is a you know, it's an independent run foundation. It will have five directors, board members of the foundation, of which uh, myself and Nishit, um, who are running the company, um, can only have a maximum of two seats on that board. Um, so the other three board members can always outvote us on anything. Um, and as opposed to, you know, we've seen a lot of projects out there where it seems like the, the split between foundation and company is more of a facade and that there's, it's really just a pass-through. We really set this up with kind of good governance that um, they, you know, they, the company shall receive support from the foundation to the extent that it's beneficial for, for the foundation. Um, and so the foundation is responsible for uh, basically the shepherding of the protocol um, and so to continue to make the, the OpenSD protocol valuable, to continue to enhance on it, get more developers to proving it, and to, um, to you know, kind of continue to expand on it. So it's like, you know, it's a starting point on a protocol. It's not the end. Um, and then also to continue to, um, you know, basically ensure that the, the ST, the simple token economy, um, that the ST economy is being managed well. Um, and so uh, that's from looking at, you know, what is the, Demand for ST. Um, are there good projects that are being built on ST? Uh, promoting you know good uses of ST, um, and so that's kind of the purpose and mission of the foundation. So we say like at the very high level, the mission of the foundation is to you know to work with developers to you know, help adopt uh, you know, consumer mainstream adoption of blockchain technology. But how is you know through um, the initiatives of, of ST and so the, the token and the protocol from the company standpoint? So the the company is. Um, you know, the, the Simple Token Company is a completely independent company. Um, it is selling a software package services um, that are designed to, um, you know, help companies with that on-ramp, with that managing of their token economies. Um, and, you know, we think with, one thing that's great about this project is that the incentives are aligned in terms of um, the software company is heavily dependent on the foundation um, and, you know, it will build a successful business that, um, uh, is based on uh, the, the foundation. And the foundation, or at least in the early days, is dependent on the company um, support in terms of uh, business development, sales, marketing, PR, um, and software development in terms of you know, building software um, on top of the protocol and that kind of um, helps more companies embrace ST. I should point out that um, you know, while Simple Token Company will be the first company developing on ST, that uh, the foundation you know, endeavors to have many, many developers doing it as well. Um, and so, you know, one way you could, could think about it is say Linux and Red Hat, um, where the foundation is like running, you know, let's say our equivalent of Linux, um, and you know, Red Hat is one example of a software company that's been built on uh, kind of promoting and kind of uh, you know, developing tools and services and software for, for Linux. Is that an exact analogy, but I think it's you know, somewhat close. Um, and so the foundation over time will be looking to have more companies that are building, uh, you know, applications, software, services, and the like uh, for ST. Uh, but you know, so our goals with this project is, you know, look, we want to, we, we want to build, um, you know, we want to help be the consumer on ramp to you know, blockchain technologies and tokenization. We want to help, um, you know, be the the service uh, provider, the technology provider that. Um, you know, starting with you know a few dozen to then a few hundred to a few thousand um, to tens of thousands of application developers um, rely on for their managing uh, their uh, token economies. And um, you know, I think our role models in that is whether you look at a company like Stripe, um, which you know, did something similar in the payment space, a company like Twilio, which is something similar in the communication space. Um, you know, it's B two B service providers who. Um, took something that's otherwise very complex and hard for most app developers to do, but could have a very big impact on their applications. Um, and in our you know, in our case, it's you know the economy behind an application that we can help um, power. Um, and so that's like you know what we want to to be able to help support and provide. Um, and then also I think we have like much bigger goals in terms of you know if we can be one of the guys out there who are helping um, you know mainstream adoption of cryptocurrency. Um, that's good for the entire community. And we can be one of the guys out there who's, um, you know, 
making uh, kind of you know, the impetus behind more developers getting closer and closer and closer to learning blockchain technology. Um, and even if they start off with a little bit, a little bit, and a little bit more, that uh, we go from, you know, I think the last number I saw was that maybe it's like about 13,000 hardcore blockchain developers uh, around the world right now. So how do you go to millions of blockchain developers or your developers who understand you know, blockchain? Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so, you know, that, you know, so we're, we're in the kind of, how do we build a bridge company, right? How to build a bridge between you know, blockchain and cryptocurrencies to mainstream adoption. Cool. Well, thanks so much for uh, for explaining this vision and coming on today. So, so we're gonna. So, what, one thing we didn't talk so much today about, but we're gonna link to it in, in the show notes, so people should check out their website and resources in the show notes. Is is that they have a simple token has a token sale coming up, which I think when is the token sale happening? Yeah. So we are right now in pre-sale for the token sale, um, and we will be allowing uh, early registration on November the first. Um, and you must register between November 1st and November 10th in order to purchase on uh, day one of the token sale. Uh, and day one of the token sale right now is scheduled for November the 14th. Um, and so only people who pre-register and go through KYC AML checks, uh, pass those checks, uh, will be able to purchase on day one. Um, and you know, the purpose of our token sale um, is you know, you know, we, we need to create the ST, create the simple token um, to fuel this, uh, this ecosystem. Um, that you can't, you need the ST in order to stake it against creating these branded tokens. Otherwise, uh, this utility, this software doesn't work. Um, so that's critical. And then also, very importantly, um, you know, as part of being that on ramp, we want to, you know, a critical part of our token sale is we're reserving 30% of the token supply for what we call our network accelerator program, which a basic way to think about it is to seed fairly interesting uh, projects where there's developers. Who have either thought through a economic model for their for their um, for their uh, their app, or they'd like some help thinking one through, but they seem like a pretty good use case. And then we can basically use some of the tokens uh, from the token generation event uh, towards helping seed these projects and helping them kind of get onboarded on the simple token and to launch successful token economies based on simple token. Um, so yes, yeah, so November fourteenth, we're really excited for it. But uh, to be you know, as someone who's raised a lot of money before. Um, the purpose of this is not a fundraise. The purpose of this is to build an endowment for the community. And I really would hope that everyone who's you know, considering a token sale really thinks through kind of, um, you know, what's, what, what are you doing this for? And for us, you know, we, we can't have simple token without having ST and we can't have um, a network accelerator kind of uh, program without creating that endowment. And um, those two things are coming together for the token sale. Cool, excellent. Yeah, so we're going to link, of course, to, to resources. You guys have some nice uh, white papers, uh, technical white paper presentations, and, and uh, quite quite a bit of uh, comprehensive resources, so people can check that out. So yeah, Jason and Ben, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, too. Appreciate it, too, very much. Bye. Okay, well, thanks so much for listening for once again tuning in. So uh, we are, you can find this episode and other episodes on lessofbitcoin.com. And if you're a loyal listener and if you want to support the show, then uh, please uh, help new people find the show by leaving us an iTunes review. And we look forward to being back next week.